Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, and I like to think that I can keep calm in a difficult situation based on my background working in a psych hospital. But when I had kids, I was constantly questioning if I was doing things right or how I was messing them up this time. Add in a child with a chronic illness and I found myself full of anxiety. Sure, I was keeping it together mostly on the outside, but the overwhelm of staying strong for everyone else was constantly threatening to be too much and result in one of those locked in the bathroom for a quick ugly cry moments. Momsiety is a real thing for every new parent, and when you add in a chronic illness, food allergy, or other challenging circumstances, it can become downright isolating. And that's why the Momsiety Club is here for you. Each week, we'll discuss all things motherhood, so join me and let's get rid of this Momsiety together. Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm Tori Levine and I am so glad you're here today. This interview is so important to me as well as I was super excited and I just love to soak up knowledge. And today I'm sharing my interview with Dr. Katherine Gray, a physician scientist who has a very impressive resume, which is posted in the show notes. But a brief summary is that she has worked as faculty in the maternal fetal medicine division at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And during COVID, Dr. Gray has led the OB COVID biorepository at Brigham and Women's Hospital with a collection of pregnancy samples from women with SARS-CoV-2 infection as well as those who have received the COVID vaccination during pregnancy. So she was recently quoted in a New York Times article, uh, which led me to reach out to her because this was something that has been a buzz online. uh, And I wanted to share the facts with you guys um, about the vaccination and the safety for when you're thinking about becoming pregnant, during pregnancy, and postpartum. So just a few reminders before you hear the interview. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and whatever app you are listening to it in. That way, when a new episode is released, it will automatically populate in your phone or wherever you listen. If you are already on the Momsiety Club email list, you'll be able to find our free resources delivered to your inbox. And if you are not one of our email subscribers, make sure that you head to join.momsietyclub.com and you can sign up for our email list. There you will also get notifications about the latest episodes as well as lots of access to free resources about managing mom anxiety, safe pre- and postnatal exercises that you can use to help you relax and manage mom anxiety. Again, just head to join.momsietyclub.com and a link is in the show notes. So without further ado, here is my interview with Dr. Katherine Gray. Hi, Dr. Gray. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, talking to us today on the Monsiety Club podcast. Thank you for having me. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Recently, you were um, quoted in an article in the New York Times all about vaccination uh, for covid while pregnant and breastfeeding. And the article specifically was about if antibodies from the vaccine can go through breast milk um, to a baby. So first off, I would love for you to tell us the benefits and or any risks of getting vaccinated if a woman is planning on becoming pregnant during pregnancy and then in the postpartum period. Um, Thanks. Um, so I think these are great questions and everyone has them right now and we're getting asked them a lot. So as unfortunately, we're still in the middle of a pandemic and there's still COVID sort of everywhere. And so 
basically the recommendation right now is that everyone should get vaccinated. And so, you know, whether you're planning on being pregnant, whether you are pregnant or whether you're breastfeeding, the recommendation as of last Friday by the CDC is that you should be vaccinated. Um, and the reason for that recommendation is one, um, we know that moms, especially ones who are pregnant, um, can get sicker when they have COVID than similarly aged women. Um, and the, additionally, um, there's protection that we think is conferred by the mom getting a vaccine um, to the baby while she's pregnant or breastfeeding. And so for both those reasons, um, the recommendation has been made. And now, because we have some months of data from the vaccine that the CDC has been collecting through the V-Safe Pregnancy Registry, we now know that in the first like 30,000 women that have been vaccinated while pregnant, there's no safety signals, meaning that um, there's no increase in miscarriages or preterm birth or any other adverse outcomes that have been noted. So while we're still in the beginning months of this vaccine, we now have a lot more data than we had in December when we first started having pregnant women be vaccinated. So I think we're in a lot better place where we have data yes. to show effectiveness and um, some safety data now. And so leading the CDC to make the recommendation that they've made that women should be vaccinated. Uh, you said that there can be some immunity passed on to the baby. Is that basic? That's the same as any what pregnant women get the D tap, right? Because they want to be able to pass that on. So you're finding the same things um, there. That's right. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so when women are vaccinated during pregnancy, and obviously most of the data we have so far is on women that were vaccinated in the third trimester since mm -hmm. the vaccine is new. So those who have delivered for us to actually look to see what the antibody transfer was were uh, largely in the third trimester. And we see good transfer of antibodies. Um, and from what we know about other infections, we think that that should confer some immunity to the baby, although they will actually have to study you know, those babies to see right. whether, you know, the, the, how protective they are, um, because that also needs to be studied. But um, we would presume that there's some level of protection conferred because we see those antibodies transferred. Wonderful. Um, now, this, again, goes back to that article, but breastfeeding uh, after vaccination, is that going to help newborn, an infant, um, and I guess, would that be different if it is an older child who's eating solid foods as well as breastfeeding? This what has come up so much <laughs> lately, um, right? Women really want to know, like, can they do anything for their older children, right? Because mm -hmm. kids aren't eligible for vaccination yet. And we're very eager to protect kids um, as, as we <laughs> all would like to do. So, you know, I think those are great questions. Um, you know, there are antibodies in breast milk from moms who've been vaccinated either during pregnancy or just, you know, while they were breastfeeding. Um, so we do see antibodies. Um, breastfeeding is a little different than pregnancy because the antibodies um, in the milk are just going to the gut. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, they definitely have protective effects in the gut, but we don't know how systemic, like if those effects transfer to the blood, how protective they'll be for the infants. And, you know, there probably is some difference for like a very young infant versus like an older infant that's not taking in as much breast milk based on what we know from other um, infections and mm -hmm. data, but we obviously don't have data yet on, you know, this for COVID. So that is another, you know, a very active area of interest for many groups studying it, but I wish, I wish we had better answers. I know there's been some social media about, you know, infants being infected when they were being breastfed by moms who've been vaccinated and moms being very upset that their children got infected. But, you know, um, but that doesn't mean that it's providing no protection. So I think, um, you know, we're just waiting, waiting to see. So right. And I, I, I want to have a good answer. You can also say, well, you honestly don't know, because if you're breastfeeding, you don't know what it, if there would be a difference if you weren't breastfeeding, right. so. <laughs> you, right, you, you, you don't, you can't do the experiment, which is why you need like right. to study women who breastfeed and those who don't and those who have been vaccinated and those who haven't, yeah. So. Yes, um, okay, so what steps should 
moms and parents who have been vaccinated do to continue to protect their children after they've been vaccinated because there's lots of th- lots of like oh we can go back to normal and I'm like no I still have kids I'm not really doing anything different uh, especially one of my children is immunocompromised so I'm not going to do anything different. We tried the little like sneak in some pumped milk because I still am breastfeeding my younger. Um, and does it really make a difference for if you give him like this much, right. <laughs> like a teeny right. bit? Yeah, it's not right. going it's, to, it's a lot of extra work. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. Um, yeah, th- these are great questions. I mean, I think the New York Times recently published an article about this topic because there's so many families asking like, okay, well, the adults are vaccinated and the kids aren't. So like, what's the right way to think about ha- what we should do now? Um, so I think it's a really complicated question. I think um, certainly shouldn't throw all caution to the wind. Um, and, you know, so a couple of things that I have in, you know, that I've been advising. One, try to encourage any adults that like regularly interact with your children, especially young infants to be vaccinated, right? So if you cocoon, make a cocoon around your children in a way, especially for young infants, if the adults that are visiting are vaccinated, then like that's a lot of protection for your family. So that's the number one thing, like really encourage like family members, all adults that are interacting to be vaccinated, promote vaccination, because that's one way we can, you know, help protect the kids. I think, you know, we can't do away with all our mitigation measures yet. So like, Mm -hmm. especially when indoors, but thankfully we're entering like a a warmer period where kids are outside more, which will be better for the spread of of COVID hopefully, but, um, you know, still wear masks for kids inside. Like we can't do away with that yet when they're still COVID actively spreading. And hopefully like by the fall, we'll have more kids who are eligible for vaccination as these, you know, vaccine trials are ongoing in those groups of kids. But until then, I think, you know, we have to keep doing lots of the things we've, you know, been doing, like stay in smaller groups, don't be in crowded indoor spaces, especially without masks and all of, all of that. Is there uh, a concern depending on the infant's age if they have to go to the store with their parent, um, you know, would keeping them in a carrier be a little bit more protective because they're not facing out doing everything? Yeah, these are these are great questions. Um, <laughs> probably so, right? Um, you know, going into areas that are less crowded at times that are less crowded is obviously safer. As we've learned over time, COVID, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is aerosolized. And so, you know, even social distancing isn't necessarily by itself protective. So what's more important is trying to be in a more ventilated place with a lower density of people. Thankfully, infants aren't that likely to get very sick. That doesn't mean they can't. But, you know, a short trip where like the infant is mostly with you um, in a, you know, contained area, whether it be in a carrier and their stroller, um, you know, probably is, you know, life has to go on, right? And there's probably, that's probably a low risk activity um, for the duration that you're there. um. Okay. Thank you. Do you have a minute that I could ask you about uh, your, um, the bio repository? Yeah. So Um, yeah, during, so just reading through your bio, (laughs) feel free to talk about it. You're doing this bio repository, which I think is fascinating. And I know lots of people would just be interested in hearing about because that lens to the research. Yeah, definitely. Um, So we've had a joint Mass General Brigham project for the, for basically a year now since the pandemic began to collect specimens from um, individuals with SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, which um, has included like all adults as well as children in the system. Um, I have been the site PI for the pregnancy biorepository at the Brigham. And so, you know, we collect, we've collected all sorts of specimens from women who've had COVID in pregnancy and put them in a biobank and utilize them to study um, SARS-CoV-2 in pregnancy. So, you know, the infection, what antibodies were generated and other things about the infection in pregnancy. Um, Once women started to become vaccinated, we also, you know, started a um, a vaccination arm of the study and to collect samples from women who'd been vaccinated as well. Um, It includes things um, for the um, COVID infection, SARS-CoV-2 infection. It includes things like nasal swabs, saliva, 
throat swabs, urine, poop, um, cord blood, placenta, breast milk, mom blood. So lots of different specimens that oh, um, yeah. will be available for like ongoing studies. So there's some very basic questions we've been trying to answer first. And then I think a lot more interesting questions that we can answer over time now that we have these samples. So, but it's only at the generosity of all the patients and nurses and providers who've helped collect these over the course of the pandemic, very generously, like in addition to their regular job. So. Well, that is fascinating. And thank you for doing this and for caring for everyone during all of this. And thank you to all the others that you're speaking of, the nurses, the other practitioners as well. Um, we very much appreciate it. And um, fi my final question is, one of the things with the Mom's Anxiety Club is promoting self-care and realizing that it doesn't mean that we're going and taking like a bathtub by our, a, a bath in the tub for an hour by ourselves. And sometimes it goes day to day what we're doing. So have you been able to give yourself some self-care today? <laughs> I think that's a great question. Um, uh, you know, I try to think about what it is I'm going to do for myself every day. I have three young boys and like any like working mom during the pandemic, um, you know, sort of used every help that we've had and haven't had a lot of breaks during this time. So, um, you know, I think um, a small break to walk outside or, um, you know, uh, ride, ride my bike inside for spinning is our, our great, um, great tools. Um, for that. And I'm seeing a friend this evening, which is, you know, the first time I've done that in a while. Um, but um, I think those are uh, really important things and it's hard to make time for them. But I think especially when you start to feel like you're very worn out, they're really important things to think about how you can sort of recharge your battery. So, yes, I love that. And I love movement anytime any type just walking out even and getting those like that uplifting <laughs> feeling a little bit more revived. <laughs> so I loved hearing that part as well. And I wish you a wonderful time with your friend tonight. <laughs> and thank you so much again for joining me. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you again to Dr. Gray. I just want to share some things that have happened since the last episode. You know or hopefully you know, because I do like to share about it, that when a new member joins the Momsiety Club, that fee for that month is donated directly to charity that benefits moms and kids with chronic illness. The charity has been the Child Life Fund at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, that's where Child Life staff assist children and their families in coping with illness, injury, or a procedure. And it enables staff to have activities and toys on hand for the kids. And I personally, not I personally, but indirectly, have benefited. And my son has benefited immensely from the ability of the Child Life staff to be able to you know, give him a car, give him a coloring book to distract him while he is getting his IV placed for his infusions every month. I have been able to, so far, <laughs> donate monthly to the Child Life staff as new members have joined the Momsiety Club. And this is my invitation to you. In the Momsiety Club, you will find a supportive group of women who are open to asking questions, asking for assistance, and providing that support about all the things in motherhood. And there you get access to weekly live workouts with me on things that you can do to help calm your anxiety as well as heal and restore your core and pelvic floor after having a baby. And if your baby is really actually older, you're still going to benefit. I work one-on-one -on -one in my Pilates studio with women who are in their 60s who are benefiting, who didn't have the opportunity to learn these um, exercises after they had their children and they are benefiting. So there's, it's never too late to start really working on healing your core and pelvic floor. Another wonderful thing is that the Momsiety Club was able to sponsor the CHOP Walk for Hope, which is a walk that raises funds 
for research into pediatric inflammatory bowel disease. And there was a program online. It was incredible. And we were able to, our team was able to actually exceed its uh, fundraising amount. And the walk itself was able to exceed its fundraising goal, which was incredible. There's so much more to tell you, but I want to get this out to you. So contact me on social media. Make sure you follow at Momsiety Club on Instagram and on Facebook. And if you have any questions, reach out to me on Instagram. And I would love to talk to you and hear your story. All right. Well, that is it for now. So thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. And if you're not already one of our awesome email subscribers, make sure that you subscribe at join.momsietyclub.com. And that is where you can find free resources as well as information about joining the Momsiety Club or working one-on-one with me. I want to personally thank you for taking the time out of your busy mom life to listen. Your time is incredibly valuable, and I'm honored that you have set aside some time to join me, whether it be while you're on a walk or on your own or multitasking with a little one in tow. Please share the podcast with a fellow mom friend, especially if you know that they have questions uh, that are pertinent to what we talked about today. All right, mama, we can get rid of this momsiety together. The Momsiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. The Momsiety Club membership is full of a group of amazingly supportive moms and pre- and postnatal fitness tips and exercises to help you mentally and physically. The first month's fee for all new members this month is being donated to the Child Life Fund at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. When you're ready to join other mamas getting through the ups, downs, and anxieties of motherhood, head to join.momsietyclub.com to become a member 